Hello from me and hello from him. Hello. <laughs> Just trying out a new jingle. I don't know whether that one's staying in, actually. We're going to try different jingles I'm each week. definitely going to bring the guitar in next week. Definitely, try yeah. <laughs> anyway, as you know, we are Liverpool Online Music, and this is our latest instalment of It's All Just Music, Isn't It? Which is my motto. And every week, Mr. Professor, he doesn't like me calling him that, <laughs> Professor Phil Beale tries to put me right and occasionally he's been successful the you've great even, liam boom actually put in his place on you've occasions you've, you've even called me an expert at various i did times. call you an expert once. Doesn't, an he expert. doesn't like that i won't call you an expert <laughs> well as usual what we try and do here we try and talk about uh, music and our own um, likes and dislikes our own uh, understanding our own perceptions our own experiences and so on and so forth i take it from a very simple point of view i just listen to the music if i like it i like it if i don't like it i don't like it simple as that Phil always um, tries to inform me that there's more to it than that. There's a lot of stuff to do with uh, history and uh, society and culture and all that kind of stuff, which I'm, which I'm not saying no, but he tries to talk to me about that stuff while I'm dancing, you know. <laughs> not appropriate. Uh, interfering with your dancing. So the only way to stop him from trying to talk over my shoulder, down my ear, while I'm dancing about all this stuff <laughs> was to agree to sit on sofas with him for half an hour, maybe about once a week. So that's the only reason I'm here. <laughs> the only reason. Okay, so what we... <laughs> At great expense, I have. I hasten to add. <laughs> <laughs> So what we agreed to do, we, we agreed each time we met, we'd like pick a decade. Good. So what we're going to try and talk about today is a decade which is not dead close to my heart, but I lived through it as a teen, and that's the 1970s. Now, I always think that when you go back to the decade when you were a teenager, and I think I started the, I started the 70s in my teens and, and end of the 70s, the 70s, just out of my teens, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. And a lot of stuff goes on through your teens, doesn't it? Yeah, all sorts of your own life experiences and this, that and the other. Yeah. And sometimes you attach your emotional experience of your teens onto certain Definitely. types of music. Definitely. Yeah. So you end up in music that seems to mean loads to you personally. Yes. And then there's all sorts of other music where you think, what are they on about? What's that got to do with me? Yes. So you end up loving and hating music, I yeah, think. Yeah, well, it can be very tribal. In your own teens, It yeah. can be tribal. Really oh, does that be. too, yeah. Yeah, you, yeah. You've got to be careful about when you're whistling a tune. And your mates here. Could, what did you time, whistling? Yeah, you know, it was like that. Yeah. All that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, and of course, the complication was I, I come from a big family, so I had older siblings, younger siblings, and they were playing their music and they were <laughs> dancing to theirs, you know. And we had all sorts of, you know, I, I was I was here and the Rolling Stones coming from one bedroom. And from another bedroom, the Smurfs. <laughs> yes. I do not lie. The Smurfs, my little sister. The Smurfs. <laughs> Dreadful. She had the album. That ain't right, I can't I couldn't have lived there, I don't think. That was the, the, but that was the 70s for you. And extra tricky if you happen to be going through your, your teens in that yeah. particular decade. Yeah. So there's lots of stuff I liked about it. Plenty of stuff I didn't like about it that just um, gone on my nerves. One of the things I wasn't dead keen was about this kind of over-the-top, um, the glam, glitter kind right, of Right, yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. Now, I was talking to you about this earlier on in, in, in the um, staff room. When I say staff room, it's just an old phone box in the back street, isn't it, where they make us go and have our lunch. <laughs> so anyway, I was talking about, uh, I call it the staff room, because I'm dead polite. In the staff room, I was saying, how did we so seem to go from 69 to 70, cross, cross over uh, into the new decade? And suddenly, everyone started wearing mad clothes. Yeah. Now, the example I gave to you is a band called Slade. Now, now everyone band. will know Slade. Yeah, come yeah, from yeah. your neck of the woods. Yeah, yeah. They've got that dead famous, it's Christmas, which I don't particularly like, because I'm not a big fan of Christmas, like, you know. Right, But yeah. anyway. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I remember them as being, you know, all glam and glitter. But well, I also the, the recall... The truth is, mate, on that subject, it's not Christmas until Noddy says it is, I'm afraid. Well, okay, fair enough. <laughs> I accept that. But I've got a vague memory of seeing Slade in the very, very early days. One of them was playing a violin, and they were wearing, um, like, jeans and bother boots, and they had dead that's short right, hair. That's right. Then the next time we saw them, they all had long hair. God knows where they got that from. And in that baggy short pantaloons and all baggy kecks shoes. And all platform <laughs> shoes. <laughs> And all glittery type stuff. <laughs> Noddy had that top out with the, you know. It's all about image. The and everyone was wearing yeah. glitter and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is there, is it possible to identify a, a thing, a moment, a time, a place, a person, a particular record or whatever that kicked off that mad obsession with um, 
all, all the glam and the glitter. I don't think you, you can ever pin it down to one particular person. No, it's it's more about a, it's more about a movement, really. And I think there was, um, without a doubt, it was. And we're talking about it specifically in the UK now. Obviously, we've got to stress sure, that. Sure, sure. Um, it was all about the the anti hippie. I think you know the 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 sixties had been all about peace, love, and understanding, and um, grow your hair out and wear your jeans and your t shirt It was a very dressed down kind of era. Yeah. But I think that, we, we, that these things have a, a shelf life, and people get a bit fed up of wearing, you know, hot jeans with holes in and and t shirt the same t shirt for a week, and they get fed up of that. So I think that from from the youth perspective, there was a kind of a a, a pendulum swing the op- in the opposite direction, really. And this would have always have been down at grassroots in. in in particularly in schools and colleges, really, I think, in the UK, uh, but also in the in the clubs uh, and, and and the music scene as well. Right, right. So, um, but but what you can do, you can't. You, so you can't actually pin down one particular person, but you can certainly take a group of people, of uh, musicians in, in in this instance that we're talking about. Mm-hmm. Obviously, other other cultural influences as well, but we're here to talk about music. So, um, David Bowie in 1969 released a fantastic number one hit called Space Oddity. And I don't know if you remember how Bowie was dressed for that. Uh, we saw it on Top of the Pops. On Top quite of the Pops, which yeah, we'll talk yeah, about. Yeah. He was a long-haired hippie at that point. Yeah. Um, by 1972, in the release of um, Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars, Bowie's whole image had changed to right. a far more androgynous, way out there, right, much right. more camp yeah, kind of yeah. uh, style, okay, uh, yeah. which had a massive influence on... Right society across the board really in terms yeah. of their dress code and stuff roxy music though were massively massively influential they mm. were again a bunch of college guys primarily and they came out of um, out of the art scene it was literally art rock right their music it it, 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 it was it was uh, again very it was based in rock but it was very different it was not blues based at all it was more almost musical like in, mm. in, in, in its structures and they dressed bizarrely, and yeah. and we we love to talk about influences that that go through decades. Initially, their their synthesizer player, he, he was a non musician. His name was Eno, uh, Brian Eno, is his oh, name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, he he lasted for two albums. Their best two albums, probably in most right. in most people's um, uh, you know uh, 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 summation. Um, but Brian Eno you know, then became a producer who influenced everything from there on and still influences music today. Mm. A, a, a massively respected music producer and writer right. and, 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 and setter of, of genres and all sorts of things. So, so Roxy Music, though, they dressed wildly. Brian mm. uh, Ferry was like some weird psychedelic um, teddy boy with a yeah, quiff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it brought, Eno was wearing peacock feathers out the back of his psychedelic sure, garb and sure. they wore space boots and the music though it stood up to that it wasn't just sure. an image of course they, they do these things to, to grab the headlines or grab yeah, the attention yeah. but if you don't back it up with the real music sure then it, it lasts you know it fizzles out but they really had the, yeah. they had the chops so I, I always saw it's certainly in, you know, in the visuals that you saw on TV Top of the Pops and so on you know all the visuals there. There seemed to be like a lot of confusion about, you know, about moving into the seventies and away from the sixties and the fifties. Because I mentioned to you before, there was two bands and they were always on top of the pops every week. One was called Sh- uh, Show Waddy Waddy, <laughs> Show Waddy Waddy, and the other one was called I Mud. Don't, I don't think this is translating at Probably all. Probably not. He's, he's, he's looking. He's never saw there. them. He's yeah. thinking, what the hell are they talking heck? about? He should, be, he, should, he should be glad he never was had to endure all that nonsense. <laughs> but it was just pop music, though. Yeah. But what I what I was what I was thinking was they were still dressing or, or in, in like a parody of, of yeah. Teddy Boy stuff. Yeah, yeah. And even yeah. you know, if you look at some of the early David Bowie stuff, the hairstyles and so on, you know, there was still they were still looking back at that era. And I think I am beginning to think that Elvis going to Las Vegas and wearing those all those glittery jumpsuits had quite an impact in terms of what musicians looked like and oh, dressed like that's a controversial um, in the seventies, yeah, because the seventies uh, glam rock clothing and so on, there was nothing really 
new that came out of that. It was either glittery versions of teddy boy outfits. Right. Or I think it was versions of Elvis jumpsuit outfits. Oh, I'm not sure about that. I don't that's know. Well, a, that's an interesting perspective. Yeah, yeah, it is. I think the space boy thing became a thing because that's probably quite a new, a new, a new, a new, new kind of direction, sure. I think, you know. So therefore, Roxy present, represented a lot of that going on. Right. Um, and Barry, particularly, of course, I mean, his next hit after Space Oddity yeah, in '69, yeah. in 1972, was Starman. Sure, so, yeah, you know, yeah. it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's all about the future. Yeah. And he, 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 he ultimately, I mean, I don't have to discuss this, the influence of David Bowie. I mean, sure. he, he was uh, one of those rare, rare nuggets that appear and just go on and on and on and change, sure. change, change their image yeah. and change their music and just... He, he obviously stuck out, yeah. He, regenerating, he, you know. But you know, I did. La I latched on to, to some degree, I did latch on to David Bowie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I wasn't crazy about the look necessarily. Right. But, um, you know, David Bowie, you could, stick, you could stick an LP on at home and sit there and listen to it. Sure. Which, which I, I quite like that idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, whereas there was loads of bands in the 70s where at least half of what they were offering you in terms of entertainment... Was the was the way they were dressed? That's right. And the way they were messing around on the stage, yeah, yeah, their, yeah. their behaviour, yeah. especially when they were miming on top of the pops, they were trying to be more and more yeah. clown-like and idiotic. Yeah. But for me, you can't take that upstairs to your bedroom and and enjoy it. It's on not your for own. that, is it? But you could listen to a David Bowie it's album. The, it's, yeah, that's right. I yeah. mean, that's Shawty Waddy Mud. They're they're sweet. There were loads of bands like sure. that. They were all having music written for them. They weren't they weren't serious singer songwritery type musicians. Right. They were showmen, you know. And sure, yeah, yeah. They had their little they they had their little you know space of time in the sun, and it, and it fizzled out eventually. But okay. um, but underneath all of that was the underground scene coming out of the sixties, where the serious musicians were, and. Um, so we've got a, an outbreak of singer songwriting going on in 1970, probably with the advent of uh, the Blue Album from Joni Mitchell. Oh right, okay. Coming out of the hippie scene very much in the, yeah. from the 60s, and um, the Laurel Canyon scene. Sorry, sorry, Chase. Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan, absolutely. Well, of Bob course, Dylan yeah. obviously initiating the 60s, but his his absolute peak period started in, into the 70s, really. I think late 60s, early 70s. Mm -hmm. Neil Young, another one, another guy that's still going now and influenced mm. millions of millions of acts over the years. Right. Uh, but again, mostly a, an acoustic guitar and a, and, a, and, a, and a voice and a genius for songwriting. You know, mm -hmm. um, all these people came out of the states and were were massively successful over here. Uh, uh, James Taylor was another one, early seventies. Sure, yeah, yeah. Carol King reached a peak of performance with her mm. release of. Tapestry in 1970, which was in the charts for about three years. Right, yeah. I mean, sold millions and yeah. millions of albums. So, lots of different strata, really. I think you could you could say um, with the with the fluff at the top, which was represented by the the Chinny Mike, Mike Chin and Mike Chapman um, songwriting combination known as Chinny Chap at the time, mm -hmm. um, which was like the Simon Cowell of its day, right, really. Sure, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was the that was the bubblegum stuff. Yeah. Um, but a much more serious genre was going on. The soul scene was was booming. Uh, Stevie Wonder was coming into his absolute nice, yeah. peak of, of creativity with the release of his um, Music of My Mind album. And again, I think that was 1970. Uh, the release of Superstition, the single mm. off, off that album. Yeah, yeah. Um, so many brilliant, brilliant artists from the States. Mm -hmm. From 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 the Motown uh, kind of Detroit kind of scene from the, from the black perspective right. primarily, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, a, an absolute melting pot really, sure. and ready to burst out. I think yeah. Slade were the first band I ever went to see play live, right? And they were just amazing, but they weren't really bubble. They weren't the bubblegum in because they wrote wrote their own stuff. They were real musicians, sure, sure, sure. But yeah, they were following trends to get noticed, wearing the bizarre you know yeah, gear yeah. and stuff. Yeah. But and they're a pop band, a, a rock pop band. But right. they were fabulous to go and see. I came out of that gig. I was about twelve, covered in little bits of plastic bitter, which they'd thrown from the stage at the nice. peak of the gig, like you know. Yeah. And the place, the Bir Birmingham Town Hall, was absolutely bouncing. Fantastic. It was incredible. Yeah. 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 So that's the start of my my um, my my what what can I put it? My my journey of watching live music right. with yeah. Slade. That's my introduction. Yeah. 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 Set up the bar very high, really. Sure. I think it was interesting if you look back at, um, you know, the musicians and, and how they were making music at the time. Because you mentioned Stevie Wonder there, who plays the piano, 
Yeah. And also in the 70s, from early on in the 70s, we had Elton John arrive, didn't it? Absolutely. Which is a guy playing a grand piano. Yeah. My thought, hang on, you know, welcome, yeah. welcome to Liberace kind of thing. <laughs> I'd, I'd have thought by then with the Who technology that, that the piano, you know, are people still playing the piano. Well, that and, goes and, back and, to Basie and, um, yeah. uh, you know, those wonderful. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah but yeah. when you think, when it, well, th yeah, those those people from the, the, the 50s and the 60s and so on, but into the 70s, the 70s always felt like suddenly everything was, it was kind of modern and shooting forward, but you still had the likes of um, Stevie Wonder playing the piano. Carol King, around a while. Carol King, a, a brilliant musician and pianist. And of course, Elton John. Elton John. Emerged absolutely. With, a, with a grand piano kind yeah, of thing, which yeah. I think that was interesting yeah. because the 70s was also a period when... Uh, Music t technology was becoming more sophisticated and more. Well, electronic, yeah, you say Stevie Wonder was a pianist. He, he <coughs> was he was obviously uh, right at the forefront of technological um, uh, breakthroughs in terms right. of synthesizers, particularly right, sequencers. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he's an all round genius. He's, sure, he's, yeah, he's yeah. a fantastic drummer. Did we know that? Right. He's an. I mean, a lot of his music was just completely written and performed by himself in most cases yeah. in those earlier earlier Absolutely, days of the seventies. Yeah. You know, yeah. um, so. Um, and he's probably best known for playing the harmonica for harmonica for God's sake. Right. I mean, but but whatever. Um, so what what are we saying there? And another kind of it's again a sing the singer songwriter end of it really. Yeah. It's it's the serious musicianship that we're talking about here, going right across the board from soul through folk music through all sorts of genres. Um, as the underground scene in the UK is mainly about rock so we've got Deep Purple coming through we've got Free coming through we've got Black Sabbath coming through um, Led Zeppelin uh, uh, launched in the late 60s right. Led Zeppelin 2 uh, Led Zeppelin 3 came out in 1970 which was actually a kind of a more of a folkish rock kind of album they were they were filling they were filling football stadium in America. Sure, yeah, yeah. They were absolutely booming over there, you know. So it was a really exciting time to be a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it was. And, yeah. and, and you say you liked, liked in a bit of a curate's egg for you, maybe. Uh, yeah, I mean, there was lots of stuff I liked. And, you know, I, I res respond to music, first and foremost, just through my me, me ears and maybe my feet. And I think, oh, I like the sound of that. And yeah. I, and I like dancing to it. You yeah. Know, you go to clubs and discos. Yeah. And I say, right, that's that's great. But there was other stuff that didn't appeal to me in the same way. But maybe later on, you know, if I listen to it again. And I, I think I used to try and separate music that I could listen to at home alone. You know, you could yes. sit in your bedroom and listen to an album. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And then there was other music that you, you'd want to hear in a bar or a club and dance to. Sure. Yeah. And never the, the twain should cross over kind of thing, in my particular view. But there was, I mean, I also, being a teenager at the time, responded a lot emotionally to music. Yeah, me too. And what was happening to me hugely, in my life. Hugely. So, you know, if I just had a big row with my parents or something and I turned the radio on, and some poor bugger, it wasn't their fault. You know, this this music came out, then that'll be fixed forever in my mind. That's absolutely it right. would remind me of fighting with my parents or something. But then there might be this other piece of music um, that I remember because I had my first experiences with girls or something. That That's right. That. It's cool. I've got an old, as well. I've got. An, I mentioned it before. My lovely, lovely older sister Helen was was massively influential right. because she was playing older people's music. She right, was a, okay. an older teenager than me. Sure, sure. And so I was a a, a fairly young adolescent kid. And she'd be playing fantastic albums by the Stones. Their 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 current whatever right, it was, yeah. you know, or time, yeah. or yeah. Deep Purple. I've mentioned before, yeah. you know, the and and uh, Fleetwood, Peter Green's Fleetwood, Matt's was in the sixties, massively influential. That blues that blues scene, by the way, is still is still going on hugely. Right. And Led Zeppelin, you know, as we we discussed in, in in part one of this series. Uh, were one of those bands that ripped ripped a lot of black uh, blues music, musicians off in, in, in lots yeah, of yeah, ways. Yeah, yeah. But still, their music was was largely hugely influenced by by American blues uh, idioms, and and it was their psychedelic take on it really oh. that made them explode. Right. Yeah. They then started feeding in in 1970 uh, a lot of English folk English folk influences into their music. Yeah which I adored them for. I love folk music personally, so okay. when they created that, that that melding together, welding together of those two genres, which is something else we'll have to talk about because genres do cross over. Absolutely. But yeah. when, when Zeppelin did that I, that, I was just lost to it. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was absolutely in awe of it. You know? yeah, yeah. Folk in the, in the 70s was a, a, another growth uh, um, 
of of the traditional really right. being electrified so again in the uk primarily so bands like steel ice span were the, probably the pop end yeah, of, of, yeah. Of, of that thing going on but fairport convention were a group of amazing musicians yeah, yeah. who really went under the radar as far as the greater public was concerned but they were just massively influential again sandy denny of fairport convention was asked to guest on led zeppelin 4 in 1971 by Led right. Zeppelin and they created the fantastic Battle of Evermore together Plant and her voices were just brilliant together right, so yeah. again this large crossover thing sure, going on sure. left all over the place black music influencing everything mm. from the roots yeah um, modern black music in the 70s started to move into a more sort of um, in the UK perspective again I've got to, got to, got to stress that into a kind of a more a more smooth, silky, soulful kind of uh, moving from Detroit over to Philadelphia, I think you know, and the influence of of, of lots of other. Um, is it Tom Bell was the producer? Ch uh, uh, Chase, I think his name was Tom Bell in Philadelphia, producing bands like Stylistics. We talked about mm -hmm. Chase, Detroit Emeralds. They were a much kind of smoother soul kind of approach right. to it. Yeah, yeah. Very, very popular in the clubs again, of course. And uh, so lots and lots of movement going on in the sure, 70s. It's sure. hugely influential yeah. right across the decade. But every decade is. But in, in the early part of the 70s, I can remember a mate of mine who was a couple of years older than me. And he worked for a guy who used to put uh, discos on. Right, at different venues, community yeah. venues. You know, yeah. you could hire a disco for your wedding and stuff like that. And this guy bought four old vans that used to belong to, I think, Scott's Bakery, and he just repainted them and he just painted all stars on them and everything. And it was got mobile disco, and he just this guy was clever, and he got me and my mate to, to do one of them, and he got just a couple of lads to run each van, and, and he just give us the bookings. You're there on Thursday, you're there on Friday, you're there on Saturday. So we go with this van, and these massive turntables, you know, to put the vinyl on and everything <laughs> and you had to have at least the top 40 in singles with you of course yeah and Absolutely. then all the albums you know, essential set all the stuff up and then you, you'd be doing you know uh, someone's wedding or something in yeah, a church yeah, or, yeah, 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 yeah. but you'd be playing everything that was in the top 40 which was quite diverse and, and occasionally someone would ask you for something like the the Wombles or the Smurfs or something. Well, so at the other end of it, that my experience was I started going to clubs during that time because I I turned twelve in nineteen seventy, and uh, so by the time I was sixteen, I was trying to get into clubs in nineteen seventy four. I was working man by that point. So, yeah. so I'm trying to work out when it happened in the seventies that the that disco suddenly transformed because my early seventies memories <coughs> of uh, discos, discotheques, was basically they played. <coughs> the top 40 or maybe they concentrated on the top 20 and they played all the popular records and sometimes you could even ask the DJ or oh, play this for our kid or play that one for my sister yeah and they'd have them all there and he'd play them but bit by bit through the 70s when you started going to maybe into clubs rather than church halls and pubs and so on disco music started becoming a bit more specific then yeah. Yeah. And, they, and they were leaving out the top 40 stuff yeah. so yeah. You know, when did that happen and where did all that new disco music come from? Well, I think you're right. It came over from the States, obviously, right. I mean, uh, primarily. And I think it was towards the middle of the 70s it started to really seep into our club our club world, you know. Right. So black music was massively influential in, 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 okay. the, club, in the clubs at the time. Uh, British bands, you'd get, you could pick out one or two, probably Heatwave. Uh, were a fabulous British uh, uh, club kind of act, right. writing disco style musics, or oh, soul at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, like we're saying, Philadelphia is hugely influential in, in the from the mid seventies onwards, really over here. Kind kind of took over from Detroit, really. I think. Mm. Would you Would you agree with that? Or oh, you, you weren't here, Chase. So, but I, th I think yeah, that that was a that was massive. Um, but but yeah, I, I was a long hair at the time. I was, I, we just talking about off, off air I was along here my, my, my acts I wanted to get them to play it would be my mission I'd, I'd pay a lot of money on the door to get into these places and the bar prices were extortionate for really awful beer yeah. so I made it my mission as a long hair to get them to play Bloody Paranoid by Black Sabbath right, or okay. All Right Now by Free all right that's right now. or Brown Sugar by The Stones do, or whatever do, do. just for one little bloody moment of joy for me right, yeah. amidst all this what I consider to be fairly wallpaperish 
you know for, nice. okay it was gorgeous and, and, and valuable but it was very samey all night sure, listen yeah, to yeah. it for four hours like you know please give me a bit of rock music you know nice, right, so I'd make okay. it my, my bloody my mission on the night to get that to, don't we used to get it, get it I actually want to <laughs> I actually want a Dobie Gray single one night at this club because I've got the longest hair in there for a bloke what <laughs> You're the True longest story. hair, you won a prize. And I won a prize, yeah, spot prize on the night. Yeah. <laughs> What's going on there? I just, just remembered that. I got Adobe Gray single out of it. I mean, how, 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 you know, I, was, I was made up. Sure. Okay, so where do, um, I'm thinking of disco now. I'm still thinking of, um, my foot starts tapping when it when <laughs> you just say the word disco. <laughs> okay, so we, the Bee Gees seemed to change. You know, it's like there was a lot of things that there seemed in the, in the 70s to suddenly change because I thought the Bee Gees used to do slightly yawny, slightly boring kind of ballady, right. hippie type stuff. Right, right. Then yeah. they seemed to disappear. Then they came back yeah. a few months later they, and they were kings of disco absolutely. for years. The, I mean, the Bee Gees, I think, were... They weren't an influential band. They used to follow the trend, I think. Yeah, yeah. They were good. I'm not, I'm not putting them down. They've yeah. never been one of my favourite artists, but you've got to admire the songwriting, you yeah, know? Yeah, definitely. So even, yeah, back to the 60s through through the early 70s, much more um, much more kind of wistful kind of um, balladeers, as you say. Then they spot the disco trend and they write, you know, the music for Saturday Night Fever in 1978 and it just goes absolutely boom for yeah, them, you know. Yeah, yeah. At which point I couldn't stand them. I couldn't right, okay. listen to this bloody weedy Manchester bloody... Why did they do that falsetto yeah, thing? So that's a, night that's, Fever, Night Fever. I it. never understood that. The was point it of then. That. From, uh, but, but, you know, they went on to write for Barbara Streisand yeah, and, yeah. you know, and people like that. And uh, they, wrote, uh, they wrote Evergreen, which was, um, what was the, what's the film Guilty. choice? Sorry? Guilty. Yeah, yeah, Guilty, another one, that's Bad right. Idea. Fabulous, yeah. fabulous songs. Yeah. But not my thing, you know, I mean... But they became very honed and, and specific about making music for yeah. that disco. they were professional songs. And, and a lot of people did that. Yeah. We, we saw a whole bunch of, of people develop their careers specifically to yeah. do with disco. That's right. Now, do you think that was a, a, um, a good thing that came out of the 70s? What came out of the 70s? Chic, chic came out of the 70s, you know. Nile Rodgers and Bernard Edwards came out of the 70s. In 1979, I was so lucky to get a ticket to go and see Chic right, yeah. for the first time. And they played all of Sister Sledge's music as well because they were producers for all of Sister and wrote all of Sister right, Sledge's right. stuff as well. Yeah. So there's beauty in it. Absolutely good times. That, that we talk about the, the, then the influence that had on rap music moving into out of the 70s and yeah. the 80s, you yeah. know. So yeah. it's it's just a wonderful time to be alive. But in the UK, we've got to pin this down to what was the, what was the you know, we talk we talk about a lot of rock bands now that were really worldwide popular that came mm. out of the UK. Black Sabbath, Led Zeppelin, Deep Purple, massively influential. Sure. But by 1974, 75, these bands were family men. These guys were in their 30s by this time, having children. And to a teenager like me, it was like 15, 16... And the whole of my youth, really, who were interested in rock music, were getting a bit bored with this. Mm. And it started to get a bit, bit, you know, a bit old. Mm, what okay. happened in the UK? The influence came over from the States, um, primarily from CBGBs um, in, in New York. Uh, the, the underground in the States were producing brilliant punk bands like the Ramones were coming through, Blondie were coming through. Um, Iggy Pop had been a constant during the seventh through the seventies. Uh, he influenced David Bowie initially massively. So their influence started to take over. New York Dolls, another band, came out of that underground Ooh, scene. The States, absolutely, bro. And 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 what that sparked off in the UK hair was metal. no teenagers hair metal. I hate. Sorry, mate. <laughs> we'll, we'll move on to that another day. But what it sparked in the UK was kids hearing these. Ramon's three chord tunes thinking, I could do that. Yeah. I couldn't. High I, abs I can't play, I can't play Stairway to Heaven, right? I'm 15, 16 years old. I'll probably never be able to play Stairway to Heaven, but fuck me, I can play Blitzkrieg Bop. Because right. that's three chords and, a, and an attitude. Yeah. So that happened in 1975 stroke six, that the, the pistols came through, all the a clash came through, 
And music just completely revolutionised in the UK. Yeah. The jam, oh, my, my ultimate band, The Jam, came yeah. through at that time. And to be 18 in 1976, which I was, was the time of my life. Right. These, and, you know, I, I dropped the... I dropped the... <laughs> I dropped the flares. And, <laughs> and went and bought my first pair of drainpipe jeans, yeah? Nice. Loved the pistols, they were just nice. amazing. Yeah. The the music was wonderful yeah. and still stands up today. And Bowie, that was massively influential. Sure. And you talk about also during the course you of the seventies. Well, yeah, that's right. But so therefore, you get an androgyny come through sure. and attitudes of well, you know, if you don't like it, who cares really? Sure, you know, yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. and Bowie declaring himself as bisexual was a huge yeah. event in the in the media and yeah, in society yeah. in the UK. This massive star, all of a sudden, what? Yeah. What is by what? You know, outrage, absolute yeah. outrage. But yeah. breaking down barriers all the way through, you know. Yeah. yeah. So no, it wasn't just music. It was much more important yeah. than that. Yeah. <laughs> so it involved trousers. It involved trousers. It went as, as far well. as trousers and shoes. Yeah. <laughs> but, but more than that, though, it was about the music for me. And I wasn't following the music out of fashion. No. I was. I felt every word and every chord. You yeah, know? Well, okay. There, some music lasts the test of time. Doesn't yeah. it? People still listen to it, and there's plenty of people now in our age group who might still listen to some music that they really liked in the seventies, but they don't necessarily go up to the bedroom and get changed into a session seventies <laughs> clothes that they keep hidden under the. Well, not well, most people don't, Philip. Don't make most it people to don't. It, son. <laughs> so most people don't do that. So they they've kept something of that period of time that that's that, that is theirs as emotionally theirs and they've locked it into their music that they liked at the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. And they can still go and fish that out of the music when they listen to I it. I mean now. I don't I don't I don't go and pick out never mind the bollocks. Um I don't pick it out these days. But I no. still listen to Paul Weller. Right. You know, and, and Weller came Weller's the same age as me, we'd have been in the same year at school if we didn't know each other. Um, and I've followed, I've followed him right the way through all his transitions into different genres right. and different bands. But the jam were the jam were explosive. They were and they were brilliant, brilliant musicians as mm, well. Mm. Um, I went to see them twice. I was so lucky to see the jam twice. They they nice. they fizzled out in 1980. You know, he he, kill, he killed it dead and went and went off in a different direction. Sure. So, um, but they they dressed beautifully. They, they were part of a. A mod revival, actually, yeah. which isn't really thought about much these days. But that happened during that time as well. I, 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 I would that. always, I would always but take it back what? to the music, though. For me, back, to, you know, back to the music, the fashion, and all that stuff. Forget it. It is, it is. That's right. But that's, the music, the music lives. The music and, lives, and especially that which has got more than one influence. I don't. I mean, like I say, I don't listen to the Pistols now. It was just angry young man music, you know, which sure. was wonderful for the moment. Yeah. And changed the, the world of music overnight. Yeah, literally sure. changed music overnight yeah. for the better, for me, yeah. in my opinion, anyway. Um, but if you listen to The Clash, they're, they're American and, and West Indian influences. You could listen to Combat Rock today ease, without any issues and mm. you'd be entranced just as you were in 1978. As, uh, you'd, you'd still be as in yeah, yeah, nine, sure. whatever it was, yeah. as entranced today as you yeah. were then, you know. So th there was and and true quality, real quality, nice. real nice. quality. So again, where are we at? I'm not sure. We're talking about a decade of change. Uh, the Beatles changed music. Elvis changed music for, for, for the better in the fifties. Uh, the Beatles completely. Th to tore that up and threw it away mm. and reinvented it in the early 60s. Um, we had to wait until 1975, 6, until that that period of development mm. Mm. was again torn up and thrown in the bin. Sure. Uh, and we went back to basics. Yeah. And, and for me personally, it was a, a massive, wonderful sure. revolution of youth, of youth. And it, not only in music, in, uh, right across culture with new designers like... Um, Oh, I can't remember the names now, but people, you know, people like Malcolm McLaren came through, who managed bands and and shops and fashion, and it all blew up in 1976. Sure. You know, in a massive way, uh, and that was that was really cool. Mm. That was really and and the King's Road was really influential at that time Lovely, as well. Yeah. Mm. You just before I just maybe think you mentioned the Beatles. Now that's the first mention of the Beatles talking about the 70s. Another Beatles. Uh, broke up as a band in 69, was 70. it? 1970. Mm. Um, so what happened to the Beatles in the 70s? Well, they, they, were, like, they all went solo, of course. They all went solo, yeah. but they were all still around in the 70s, producing singles and albums. But unfortunately, 
the the individuals were nowhere near the sum of the parts, you know. Right. They really weren't. Right. And yeah, Lennon was massively influential, continuing on with his peace um, peace initiative. Uh, moved over to New York, of course. Yeah. Uh, and he essentially retired, really, in about 1975, I think it was. Yeah. Uh, McCartney carried on playing and singing and, and gigging Wing. and performing. Didn't you do Wings? You did Wings, wings for that's right, yeah, yeah. The world Massively that. successful. For yeah. me, For me, I couldn't really listen to it because it was just nowhere near the quality of the right. Beatles music, I, I didn't think. No. Um, okay. So they never died for me. Yeah. I still played their music all the time, mm. but I didn't really buy into the indi the individual careers. Right. I bought Imagine the album that Lennon released. Right. I later bought the the Plastic Ono Band, which had preceded it sure. album, uh, because it was full of soulful, you know, right. soulful, really soulful songs. Um, but really, as an influence, they they died in 1970, I think. Yeah, um, the Stones took over, uh, but towards the end of the 60s, they. They really started revving up with, with the release of uh, uh, singles in 1969, like or 68, 69, like Jumping Jack Flash, Honky Tonk Women. They really started to take over anyway as the Beatles were fizzling out. Sure. And in 1971, they released Sticky Fingers. Uh, 1970, I think, Let It Bleed. They were huge. They were rock royalty. I mean, oh, they, yeah. they ultimately, uh, that ended in, in, in that sort of period of growth, peaked in 1972 with a uh, double album called Exile on Main Street which is just genius, but steeped in Americana, totally steeped in country and, and blues music. Right, yeah. That was their love, their sure, passion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they created a wonderful amalgam of all those influences. And Exile on Main Street is the, is the, is the absolute peak, the epitome of, of what they were working on. Mm. Uh, they started to fade after that, and uh, and that's when punk took over again. Really, mm -hmm. they were another example by 1975 of releasing pretty shit music, really, and it's all got a bit boring and it's all a bit long in the tooth. Mm. So, I mean, they had the odd, the odd success there. After they moved into disco in 1978 with Miss You, which is a great track, but it was like a it kind it kind of been a long time since they've had a hit, you know. And then it was a bit cynical. Oh, so the Stones are doing disco now. Like, yeah, everybody's oh, yeah. got to do a disco oh. tune. Yeah. Um, so if you were trying to sum up then if I said to you can you put your finger on in, from your point of view your opinion the worst thing that happened to music in the 70s and in your view the best thing that happened to music it's really subjective and every person yeah, who asks that sure, question of will sure. have a different answer sure the, the, the thing I hated most about music in the 1970s was the manufactured pop end of it right. which we have talked about uh Chin and Chapman yeah. hated it, absolutely hated it. That was the worst part. That was the worst of music, I thought. The worst it yeah. could possibly get, really, was that horrible manufactured pop. The greatest thing that happened to music in the 70s in the UK, without a doubt, was the advent of punk rock. Right. And the punk explosion. Right. And all that followed and flowed into yeah. later, later, yeah. later decades. So what would you say now are... The main influence, or a couple of sort of major influences that that, that came about in the seventies, but we can still see now that it run through the eighties, the nineties, and into present day music. David Bowie, right, yeah. Brian Eno, yeah. Paul Weller in the UK again. He's not he's not that big in the states, but he's still a huge act in 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 the UK. He's not having chart hits anymore, I guess. But I think Eno really is he's probably the, the best example of that because his production has gone into all sorts of genres sure. since then. You know, he was influential with U2 in the 80s, massively built U2 into the biggest band of the decade, you know, mm. moved on beyond that into the 90s into all sorts of different mm -hmm. acts and, and, and so on. So I think I think Eno, Eno massively influential. Uh, Niall Rogers... Oh my God, so influential! Nile Rodgers is still having hits today sure. with with younger acts that are teaming. He's teaming yeah. up with like um, Pharrell, um, for example. Just one example of the, but, but what's going on now. Nile Rodgers started with Chic in coming out of New York in 1978-9, and he's still at the top of his game right, now. Yeah. You know, so fabulous stuff, wonderful stuff. Mm. And we also, you know, we've got to think about the advent of, of, the, of the rap scene in 1979 as well, 80 with with, with uh, Sugar Hill Gang, with people like that, Tone Lock, people like that coming through mm -hmm. and moving into being the, 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 the major musical 
uh, movement of the following 30 years, really. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that all started in the end of the 70s as well. Yeah, mm. blimey. If you could go back to the 70s, and just in one particular year for a week, where would you go back to in time? And what trousers would you be wearing? That's what I want to know. <laughs> And what shade of lippies? And what shade of lippies? Look, just butt out you. <laughs> I never went down the lippy route. Yeah. I was a fucking hairy ass engineer, man. You don't ever got away with that in the fucking pub, do you? <laughs> um, I had a motorbike. I had all that going on as well. What, oh, God, what week would I pick out? Jesus. 76 was a good year because it was the hottest year on record for years, wasn't you it? You know what? You're absolutely right. Yeah. But 1975 okay. was also almost as hot. Was it? My sister got married in 19, the summer of peak of the summer of 1975. And I had to go and fetch the, um, the, the trifle. The trifle. From home. Sh- By the time I got it to the bloody village all where yeah, she was, exactly. the trifle had melted. <laughs> but that, 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 um, that, was a great, that was a great time. Yeah. And, and I think... Uh, now I'm here by Queen had just been released while my sister was getting married. Actually, yeah, it was right. played at the at the uh, right, reception. Right. Yeah. Um, that was a real turning point as well. There was lots of good stuff. I don't know. I can't pick one week. I just can't do it. Okay. Brilliant memories all round. Yeah, okay. Okay. So um, you know, I think that like because you guys started with uh, Slade and like a Christmas song. Yeah, and you started going on about Bill Bowie. And his whole like androgyny and stuff. In '79, as you end this decade, you got to remember that it ends with Christmas, with David Bowie in regular clothes doing a Christmas video with Bing Crosby. Oh, with Bing Crosby, what a yeah. great. Singing, Was that '79? Um, Interjection. Rubber boom. Singing, um, um, drummer boy. Little drummer boy. Little drummer boy. Rubber beautiful yeah 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 beautiful. that was that was an excellent video that yeah, was yeah. like power it, of video and sure, it was yeah. again a, 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 like you say a combination of the old and the new there mm. and fabulous yeah. what a great thing to end on we'll, we'll go for that we'll go for that like Bowie growing up because he right. had his boy Duncan that's right. and everything that's like right. that that's and right. like that's he's right. like, yo, listen. I love it. I'm all about music. I love it. I love it. We'll yeah, go for music, isn't it? We'll go yeah, for it's Christmas. all just music, ain't yeah, it? Blimey. It's all just music, That's what mate. I think. <laughs> but it ain't, is anyway, it? Anyway, <laughs> I think Professor Beale here is nearly ready for his lie down, folks. I think, yeah. Yeah, when we go off air, he puts his legs up on the couch. That's a nice thing. He goes to sleep. Yeah, anyway. Okay, so. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, do you want to give me a two sentence sum up of the 1970s? Two De- sentences. Decade of change and revolution in music. That's, uh, I would, I'd say hey, that's not bad, though. The I'm decade of change and revolution. The yeah. decade yeah. of change and revolution yeah. in music, the 1970s. Yeah, okay, absolutely. I'll go along with that. I'll go along with that. Go along Thank with you. Okay. Right, so. It's been awesome. We've been Liverpool Online Music. With the, with the strobe effect. And today's <laughs> episode of It's All Just Music, isn't it? Was about the 1970s, it was, yeah. and as usual, I've put uh, Professor Beale on the spot here and picked his brains, uh, you know, to, to delve deep into the mind of the man that knows all things about music. No, and I've just sat, <laughs> I've just sat here and tried to annoy him basically <laughs> with all good questions, which I enjoy doing. It's Mr. Phil Beale, I've been Liam Boom, and Great as far as I know, here. I still am. So Great it's a goodbye here. from him, thanks, mate. Great to be here, and a goodbye from me, yeah. Ta-da. Over and out.